Lord, I'm asking you throughout the rest of this service by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would lead us and guide us and then let your Spirit be that provoking factor in our life that causes us to move towards change. Lord, I pray for a performance of your Word today. Uh, not just in speech, Lord, but in power and demonstration. Lord God, how we need to see the power and how we need to see demonstration. So Lord, I'm asking for an anointing to help me today. I, I'm in uncharted waters right now. And so Father, I'm asking for a definite direction, a leading, a guiding, a prompting, a moving that your word and your will be accomplished in this house, in the lives of these people, that we will be forever changed, forever, forever, forever changed, never to go back, never to look back, never to want or desire to be back, but only move forward in the power of the Spirit. Let there be a demonstration of your word today. I'm careful to praise you, Father, and give you all of the glory. For it's in your precious name that we say, Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. I believe that we need to see not only the word, but we need to see it demonstrated. Uh, there's, there's an attitude that we must get to um, the doctrine is fine. We know what we believe. We've been taught what we believe. The Word of God states for us to believe it. But it goes on to say a few more things about it. It says, uh, signs and wonders will follow those who believe. How many, how many wants to see uh, a doctrine uh, fulfill itself in a people? Where it said, where the scripture says, the scripture says that, that we are the head, we're not the tail. How many wants to experience that in your life? Uh, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. How many wants to get a part of that? Uh, the, the, we, can, we are greater, more than the scripture says, conquerors. How many wants to walk in a victory this morning? Oh, I'm telling you, y'all, there's a lot on the table today. There's a lot on the table today. The word of the Lord has come. It has directed. It has prompted. It has moved us. Now what are we going to do with it? Amen. What are we going to do with it? Why can we not move in it? Why is it that we do not see power? And why is it that we do not see demonstration? The Apostle Paul said that he didn't want to come and speak to you and with eloquent words or didn't want to come and say something that sounded good, but he wanted to, he wanted to move in power and in demonstration. Now, now, when I start thinking, to start thinking about uh, power and demonstration, I have to stop thinking about our limitations. You see, whenever we start thinking about supernatural, the first thing the devil does is begin to plant seed in our mind. You can't do that. Uh, the, when we start wanting to move in a, in a I'm going to use the term apostolic uh, doctrine, where, where we've been taught that we have power. We've been, we believe that there's power. Let me go down the road for a moment. How many believes that the Bible teaches us that we are to be a people of power? Amen. That we should be able to have the power and the authority to command those things that are not and see them as they were. Yeah, yeah. I'm not talking about as they can be or as they're going to be. According to the Scripture and, and the economy of heaven, it's finished. It's already been done. And God is waiting for a people to come to a revelation and a knowledge that what He's done for us, He's already done. Amen. And it's up to us to walk into the power 
of the Word of God that's already been spoken towards our situation. So the question comes to mind, what is my problem? Look at that one to your right. Talk to the back of their head because they're looking to the right. And say, what's your problem? And before they turn around and see who it is, you turn and look the other way and ask them, what's, what's our problem? If God has appropriated a word of power and authority, then what's our problem? I think if I was going to title this, and this is coming off the cuff right here, I'd title it, What's Our Problem? Why are we not walking in authority? Why are we not walking in, in, in the place of signs and wonders to where we can see the, the awesome performance of God by His Spirit at the, at the uh, yielding of our wills to His will and the appropriation of the Word of God mixed with our faith. Look at somebody and say, what's our problem? Why do we st- seem to still be anemic? Why do we stand back and watch the enemy wreak havoc with our families? Seemingly have his way in our life in nearly every area. Let's, let's, let me throw this in our finances. How many struggling in that area right now that you say, okay, God, if you don't, I don't know what's going to be. But what about, what about the, the authority that God has given us? He's placed it at our our fingertips to use. And so when I think about why, I I, I heard myself asking this question, Wes, what's the problem? What's the problem? Now I'm going to draw you in just a little bit and I'm going to turn around and get to the Word. But I, I want to connect with everybody in this room today. I would like to connect somehow or another, and it's going to take God in a supernatural way to do that because, it, you know, it's approaching 11 o'clock. Our, our breakfast is wearing off. There's something, some anointing on them chairs that makes us want to go... We're laughing. We're laughing. But I want, to, I want to land here for a few minutes. We've got to understand that when God is trying to get us to a word that's going to bring us into a place of power, we've got to understand this. Is everybody listening to this little, next little simple phrase I'm fixing to say? Because we take it for granted. If God's trying to move us into a place of power and authority, no matter what place that is, for whatever reason that it is, whether it's mundane things or whether it's some super battle that you're facing that you don't know how I'm going to overcome it, or whether it's just life showing up that it's got you defeated, here's the bottom line. If God is appropriating power and authority for our lives to where we can move forward and up, We've got to understand that the devil, the enemy of our soul, the arch enemy of God is going to try to stop us. Look at your neighbor and go, it just don't get any simpler than that. But the danger comes in revival temple is when we do not recognize that as the weapon of choice of the enemy. If the devil can lull us and keep us into a place of, well, you know, it's going to work out. You know, I'm telling you, 
sooner or later that just keeps increasing and we, we turn around and look and we've lost part of our family. We turn around and look, we've lost our job. We turn around and look, we've lost our relationship with God. We turn around and look and we're, we're in turmoil. We turn around and look and there's no peace to be had. We turn around and look and we think, my God, what happened? So let me see if I can find some word to go along with this. How many will agree with me if I say that the world is in turmoil? Let's bring it home. How many will agree with me and say that you've realized of late that you are in a battle? I, I need some help this morning. How many in this room have been in a battle, at least one this week? Let me see your hand. How many of you are in an ongoing battle? I mean, it's, it's there. You wake up in the morning and it's there. You go to bed at night and it's there. You, you know, you go to work and, and it's there. It, now, I'm just, y'all work with me for a moment. How many of you have gotten used or accustomed to dealing with the battle? What does that look like? What does that sound like? It sounds like, well, that's just the way it is. It sounds like coming out of our mouth, it is what it is. It sounds like coming out of our mouth, well, it goes with the territory. Can I tell you that there's a lot of things that we have in our life that don't go with God's territory? There's a lot of burden, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of fight, there's a lot of struggle that don't come with God's territory. It has no right in God's territory. It should have no authority in God's territory. But somehow or another in our, our ability not to connect the eternal and deal with the temporal... The temporal becomes more important than the eternal. And so in, instead of listening to the Spirit of God, which is eternal, we begin to listen to the voice of man, which is temporal. And Paul said, or, or Jesus said, that those two are, are enmity against each other. They're enemies of one another. So how do we get past and be able to recognize when something is genuinely attack and is sent with purpose and prejudice and something that is part of our life because we're human. Let's look for a moment. The Bible does teach us that we have an enemy. How many is aware of your enemy? How many knows he's against us? He wants to stop us. He's hell-bent on keeping us out of realizing the promise of God that's already been given. Uh, we need to understand that um, what God did for us, it's already been mentioned in Word today, Jesus paid the price for it on Calvary. And then he said this saying, and, and he wasn't necessarily talking about what I'm talking about right here. He said it's finished. Would somebody like to tell me what he meant by that? What? What's finished? Everything. The fight, the battle, the struggle. The victory has already been given. Well, then why do we walk so encumbered? Why are we feeling helpless in the generation that we live in today? I'm just asking. How many when you listen to the news, you turn it off feeling helpless? thinking to yourself, I just have to take that on the chin because there ain't nothing I can do about it. You wonder, would I make a difference if I said anything? 
Well, I'm here to tell you. I'm here to debuse us of that notion that we have been given the power, the right, the authority, and if we can get our little ducks in a row in our own lives, God will release that power through us and in us. Can you say amen to that? All right, all right. I don't think I'm going to be fronting long in front of you this morning. So what do we have to do in order to become who God's called us to be? This is simple. You ready? The first thing we've got to do, the first thing I've got to do is decide I'm going to win. How many can think of a situation that you're in right now and you don't know which way it's going to go? Let's take the first step forward right now. If there's anybody in this room today that's in a situation right now that you don't know how it's going to turn out, I want you to stand on your feet and say, I have decided I'm going to win. I am going to win. I'm going to defeat it. I'm going to come out on top of it. I'm going to look back at it one day and say, why did I let you hold me down so long? I'm going to win. Keep standing, keep standing. Father, in the name above all names, I declare over these that are standing today the absolute power to walk in a victory that can only come from heaven. It won't come from somebody's brilliance. It won't come from somebody's uh, clever thinking. But it's going to come by my spirit, says the Lord, when my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Say, I'm a winner. I choose to win. Yes, sir. You may be seated. We must claim it. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. The apostle said this. He said, we are his workmanship. Notice what it says. Created in Christ for good works. <laughs> Come on somebody. Which God prepared when? When did he prepare this for us? Beforehand. Can I tell you? That God doesn't look down in the middle of our struggle, in the middle of our trial, and think, oh my God, what am I going to do? Well, he couldn't say that because he don't have him. He'd have to say, oh my me. What am I going to do? But he's already appropriated your victory beforehand. He's already declared you triumphant beforehand. He's already said that you can overcome this thing beforehand. He's already given permission for you to celebrate your victory before you ever walk in it beforehand. Ah, how many of y'all look at your spouse every now and then and think, God, what are you doing to me? Can I tell you that he's already de dealt with it beforehand? Amen. He's already dealt with anything that comes up against us, church, uh, beforehand. But I'm going to make a simple statement right here. The struggle can get very real sometimes. Can you say amen? amen. How many believe the struggle can get real? Amen. All right, I told you I need some help. Here's your chance. I want you to take just a moment as I meander through this. And I want you to look back at your life. Take just a moment. And it's easy for us to look back at other people's lives. But I want you to focus on you this morning. I want you to focus on the good. And I want you to focus on the bad. I want you to try to think of the times that you got it right. 
Is that good? How many, how many can think of a time that you made the right one? We need to celebrate that. Amen. Now, how many of you can think of the place that you took the wrong turn? We all have to deal with this thing called life. But in order to be walking in the victory that God already has given to us beforehand, there has to be an acknowledgement in our spirit, through our minds, through our understanding of the very seed of our being, our heart. And whenever it comes to the forefront of our mind and our heart, now, I'm going to preach just for a few more minutes. But I felt last night, yesterday afternoon and last night, that God truly wanted to do a work in the, in the congregation today. Amen. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I feel like it is. I believe there's two areas that God wants to set us free from. I'm going to go on and say this, that like many other things in our life, if we take care of the main problem, a lot of other small problems just go away. So we're going to work with that. But I'm going to tell you what I've been praying since early yesterday afternoon specifically for this. And I believe that the Lord settled on two things. they settled my spirit on two things. But before he settles that in us, we first have to be aware that we have an enemy that wants to kill us. He wants your family. I've said this before, I'd hate to be raising kids right now in the world we are in. And the devil is all out for them. So the best thing I can do as a parent, as a daddy, as a grandpa... I'm telling you, just as, just as early as last night, just as early as last night, I went off in my little private place for a moment and I prayed for my grandchildren. Yeah. Amen. I just took a moment and prayed for our grandbabies. Yes, God. Not, that my older, not that my kids aren't important to me. They're old enough to fend for themselves. I still pray for them. But I'm trying to say this this morning is that we've got to become identifiers of what's really going on inside of us that's keeping us powerless. Melissa, if you would come to the keyboard, please. As we look back at our lives and we think, see things that are good and bad, it's, uh, help me, Holy Ghost. It's hard for us to do, to look at the bad things. We can celebrate good things, right? But I want to talk for a moment to people that seem to be stuck in a place that God wants, that He's already delivered you from. The reason that this is hard because it sometimes is hard. Are you listening? It's hard to take the cover off of that and acknowledge it. I'm asking everybody in this room because I believe everybody in this room has an enemy. I'm asking everybody in this room because I know that everybody in this room has a past. I'm asking everybody in this room because I know that there's a lot of unanswered prayers that you've not seen answered yet. I'm asking everybody in this room to withdraw your judgment from people around you and withdraw that that compares you to somebody else and says, well, they do it, or they did, or they don't, it don't seem to bother them. And I'm going to ask you to uncover it and say, Holy Spirit, Y'all know one of the things that I'm longing to see happen in the church? I am longing to see an authentic spirit of conviction. 
felt, I felt that when I said that. I'm asking for an authentic spirit of conviction. I'm asking for the ability within ourselves to be able to recognize the difference between conviction and condemnation. See, the reason that we won't take the cover off is because we've confused the mercy, grace, and love of conviction with the damnation of Condemnation pushes us away. But conviction says, okay, Lord, I'm opened up. While you're there, go ahead and show me something else. Here's two areas. Number one is disappointment. How many in this room have been victims of of disappointment. Go ahead, just go ahead and exp- rip the cover off. Go ahead and rip the cover off. You've been disappointed by something. Somewhere along the road, something didn't work out like you wanted it to. Somewhere along the road, somebody didn't perform to the level that they needed to. Maybe you've prayed and prayed and prayed for something and still had to walk in the aftermath of the decision. And there's a disappointment in you that keeps you from trusting God for better. What's the best way not to be disappointed? Is not to expect anything. If I don't have some level of expectation, there's no way I can be disappointed. I've used this illustration probably a thousand times of a little girl that I was, I was driving a busload of people to Disney World. And for 14 hours, that little girl and her mother sat right behind me. And, and all I heard all the way there was the Magic Kingdom. I can't wait to see the Magic Kingdom. I can't wait to see the Magic Kingdom. I can't wait. To, and they talked about it for 14 hours. I was tired of the magic kingdom. I, I'm telling you, I got to where I was wanting to see it for a minute, you know, just, just so I can say, okay, okay. And y'all, how many of y'all been to Disney and you come around that last little long bend that got the tower with the Mickey Mouse ears on it? You see that, right? And you come around and then all of a sudden, there it is, the kingdom. Magic kingdom. And in the background, you can see the castle. And the mother said to the little girl, said, there it is. There it is. The little girl's like, well, where? Right there. there we're there. We, finally, we pull up to the gate that says Magic Kingdom. And I'm like, uh-oh. Because that little girl goes like this. It don't look like a Magic Kingdom. I want to talk to that that heartbeat of that soul. That something you had a great anticipation for didn't turn out. When you got to it, it wasn't what you expected. You said, I didn't sign up for this. I was hoping for more. But disappointment has made its way into my life. And I don't know what to do with it. And so, whether we go, let's rip that cover off. So what it does, it keeps me from anticipation of enjoying something else. So we miss out on blessings that God has for us. Perhaps job opportunities. Perhaps uh, opportunities to minister the gospel. I'm just, I'm telling you, this can go a million places today. But I want to talk to that, that soul that says, Brother Wes, I'm disappointed. Now, we're fixing to rip the cover off of this thing, but I'm going to ask you if that's you to stand up right there strong where you are. I'm disappointed. Come on, all over this congregation. Go ahead and rip the cover off. That's the first step of being healed. 
I'm not going to ask you what you're disappointed about because it'd take too long for us to hear it. But can I tell you that the Heavenly Father knows everything about your heart? He knows why you're disappointed. and He knows what to do for your disappointment. And, and he, knows, he knows that somehow or another that in your disappointment, where you stand, that he's, He loves us too much to hurt us and, he, and He's too wise to make a mistake. He knows how to fix it. Remember earlier in the service I said first thing we've got to do is decide to win. I'm going to wait just a few seconds more because I know by the Spirit that there's more that needs to stand up. You're just disappointed. You say, well, if I face my disappointment, do I have to confront what disappoints me? That may not be your place. That might not be, your, that might not be on you. But I know the one that says, I'll take it on me. And he's already done it. All we have to do is give it up. I'm going to wait just a little bit more because I sense the Holy Spirit is speaking. I'm fixing to dig a little bit. Maybe your marriage didn't turn out like you hoped. You got to be careful with this one. Maybe some episode in your life with children didn't turn out like you thought it would. Maybe you've made some wrong decisions that has brought disappointment to your life. There's a lot of people standing up. Now how many is ready to give this disappointment up? They're still standing. I can't quit yet. Disappointment. You know, my dad died real young. I was disappointed because I, I had great anticipation. I'm going to say something that I'm just being real. I'm ripping the cover off. His family's here today with the Sister Shavers and his daughter Judy. But we buried Brother Ellis Shavers this week, 91 years old. And he had the opportunity to know that he was getting ready to leave this earth. And that man took care of everything that he wanted to. He told all his grandbabies. He told all his family. He gave them advice. I stood there and listened to some of that and just thought, Oh, my Lord, how blessed they are to have that opportunity. Because my daddy died in a heartbeat. He didn't have time to say bye. And I've often wondered which would be the worst. But I've come to the understanding that God gives us all our lives to live. And we have to work it out with fear and trembling. So maybe you're facing a dilemma that can't change. Maybe God's placed a period at the end of this disappointing thing to you. And you wonder to yourself, how am I going to overcome it? My short answer to that is by the blood of the Lamb, by the mercy and grace that is, His love endures forever. And somehow, some way, Father, in the name of Jesus, to all of those that are standing, with those that are standing, would you hold your hands in a position as if you're about to receive something? I want you to anticipate God's bringing to you that which is going to heal that disappointment in you. How many believes that, that healing's ready? How many believes that healing's yours? How many believes that you can have the healing that God is, has ordained for you? He said it's already, He's already performed it. It's already done. Then Spirit of the living God, let every person in standing in my, this room with their hands expecting to receive, may the power and the presence of God right now come and bring healing to disappointment in their life. Let the healing virtue of the Spirit of God address the area of disappointment. And let the healing virtue flow from heaven. You say, Brother West, will I feel different? 
eventually you sure will. Eventually when disappointment finally leaves and gives, gives room for the Holy Spirit, the question will not continue to be why, but the question will be, you'll, say, you'll begin to say, Lord, thank you for bringing me through. So in the name of Jesus, may the Spirit that cancels disappointment. <laughs> Woo. May the Spirit that cancels out disappointment become so evident that people are going to begin to know without them ever saying a word that they've been healed, that they've changed. I want to say one more thing about disappointment. I'm saying this by the Spirit of the Lord that this is not going to be just a way that you can learn to deal with your disappointment. God's getting ready to snatch it up out of you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Okay, you can be seated, but don't be seated the same way you said you stood up. Now, you might be getting ready to stand up again, but the second major thing, and it's the most powerful thing. It's the most powerful. It's where heaven and hell hinges. How many of you realize that big doors swing on small hinges? And sometimes little hinges provide access to great things. I bet y'all, I, I guarantee you, some of y'all already know what I'm getting ready to say. It's a booger bear. It's the hardest one. It's the one thing that Jesus looked at his disciples and said, unless you can forgive, you cannot be forgiven. Now, now that, that, that ain't nothing you can do with that. You can't, you can't say that in a nice way. That is what it is. And I'm telling y'all something. If you've lived long enough, you've come across enough hurt in your life to know the difference between something that just come along and, and hurt your feelings and something that come along and had the potential to kill you. Right. To, to snuff out the light of God in your life. To snuff out life in you. To snuff out that, that enjoyment for anything and for everything. You know, to snuff out the, the possibility of being happy again. The hatred of an action or someone. How many of you have certain places that you won't even drive by? Let me try that again. How many of y'all have something or somewhere that you avoid? That sounds better, don't it? How many's ever been walking in Walmart? And you, you walk and you're just having a good time, you go... I'm going to give y'all a chance to be honest because I've seen y'all do me that. <laughs> I got radar, y'all. How many knows what I'm talking about? You see them before they th you think they've seen you and you, you go, I'm up, I'm up in there shopping for toilet paper and stuff, you know. I'm over there stuck in the fruits and the vegetables because I can't get out. I want you to take the cover off. You remember what I said earlier 10 minutes ago about conviction? This is where we need it. I need to be convicted of my hard feelings. I need to let the Spirit of God Confront me. About my hard feelings. Towards situations. Towards people. I could go on and on. But I'm going to be gracious to you. Because this is a subject. That does not need a whole lot of explanation. You know when you're hurt 
You know when you have hard feelings. And you know when you have unforgiveness in your heart. I'm asking you to uncover it today. I'm asking you to take a real good look at it and give it to God because what we don't realize, y'all, is these covered up, hurt, hard feelings cause us to act certain ways that everybody else in the world can see. And we think we got it all incognito and hid and stuff like that. You can let me talk to somebody three or four minutes and I can tell you something about them. They don't have to tell me their story. Their eyes do. I'll say one more little thing. Then I'm going to ask, I'm going to give us the opportunity to uncover it. If you've ever been through something that hurt you and cut you to your core, betrayed, And hatred set in. And you couldn't think of any, you know, you've dreamed a thousand times about how you could get even. You've even said to yourself, if I could do it and not be detected, I'd, it'd be bad. How many's ever, how many's ever done that? You, you said, if, if I could do what I want to do and not get caught, I'd do it. stood close enough to a man one time on more than one occasion that I hated so badly that with a pistol in my back of my waistband and the only thing that kept me from doing what I wanted to do was I didn't want to spend the rest of my years in prison and my kids be raised without a daddy. God used something that simple to hold me at bay until one day, one fateful day, the opportunity came to kill him or forgive him. And I could have done either one at that moment. You say, you, Brother West, y'all have no idea who I used to be. Y'all have no idea the power of the enemy on any soul that I'm looking at right now that without God we have, we can become that. We can neglect pain. We can neglect forgiveness. We can neglect conviction. We can do away with all of that until one day we are as rotten and we are as mean and we are as evil. Capable of anything. But thanks be to God. That the Holy Ghost is, is strong enough to put you in a place. Now, I think about that fateful day and I remember how God must have trusted me. To give me the choice of this or this. And I made the right choice. And I don't mind telling you it was absolutely the beginning of it. was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. But the moment it was done, the moment I looked at that man and said, I need you to forgive me for hating you. I didn't walk up there and say, you need to be forgiven. I realized that I, the offended, had now become the offender and the burden was on me and not on him. And when I looked at that man and said, I need you to forgive me for hating you. He looked back at me and he said, I was wrong. And y'all, the burden of the world lifted off of my shoulders. And I started forward from that day. And I haven't quit climbing since. That's the power of forgiveness. Now, you notice that I didn't go into no detail about what? You know why? Because it doesn't matter. Did y'all hear what I said? It doesn't matter what hurt you. What matters is how you deal with it. 
Can I say that again? It doesn't matter what hurt you. What matters now is how you deal with it. And it can be life or death, or it can be power and life. Scripture said this in Deuteronomy. He said, today I've placed before you life and death. He said, therefore, choose life and live. Here's our opportunity. How many needs to walk into a, an amount of forgiveness today that you've never been able to before and put this matter at ease and at rest? One, two, three. Stand up. Come on, don't make me count again. I can't count much higher than that. And I know, and I'm not just trying. I know there's more. I, I do. It, but by the Spirit of God, I know there's more. You ready? Go ahead and stand up. Don't, don't, don't make everybody else wait and miss lunch. Come on. Come on. Just a little bit more. Let conviction find its way into your life. Well, Brother West, if I forgive, that's going to make me vulnerable. My God's able. He'll fix it all. He will fix it all. I'm going to wait just a little bit more. You can't live this life without getting hurt. That's all there is to it. But what we do with it is up to us. Is this everybody? I'm not going to ask that. Let me use my statement. Come on, somebody. Have y'all ever wondered why it takes so long for people to go, okay, all right. When it's the best thing that you'll ever do, it'll set you free. It'll put you in a place of continuing to forgive. And instead of being a, a disaster of unforgiveness, you'll be a proponent of forgiveness and God will begin to use you to set other people free. Amen? See, I now have some authority to set people free in the name of Jesus. Because I understand it. Are you ready? Father, in that name that is far beyond any name that I, I don't mean to say it frivolously. I say it with a, a great amount of reverence. Jesus, Jesus, I am asking you, Lord, to look deep into the heart of men and women and let Jesus be found in their spirit, in their soul that will cover this unforgiveness, that they will say to themselves, I am done with this. It will control me no longer. And I thank you for forgiveness, Lord. I thank you for forgiveness. I sense that there are some that are watching online right now that you are sitting there with tears in your eyes wondering, how can I overcome this? The word of the Lord to you is feel the spirit of this service that's going on today and walk free of unforgiveness. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I've got to add one thing to it. You should have said, yeah, I knew one more thing had to be coming. There may be somebody that you need to go to. It will be the hardest, most liberating thing you've ever done. You will realize why Jesus died on the cross. When you can crucify yourself enough to go to an individual that has hurt you, had potential to destroy you, and realize that I am now the offender and I need to be forgiven. There will be a power that will come over you that the devil can't do nothing about.
This is the power and the attitude, the sign and the wonder that I'm talking about. I'll never forget the evening I came in from work. Without ever saying a word, my wife looked at me and she said, My God, you look different. What happened? Why? Because all of that, all of that sin and all of that unforgiveness and all of that pain and all that I'd been carrying for years was gone. And I remember that night standing, looking in the mirror and just bust out laughing because I wasn't looking at the same man I'd been looking at for six years. God's able. Now promise me that you're going to keep saying this, I will forgive. I will to forgive. It's my will to forgive. If there's any forgiving done, I'm going to do it. I will forgive. I will forgive. And you're going to, disappointment's going to leave. And you'll be free to move on, to move up, to move over, to continue out. God is able to set us free. Amen? Could I give the... Could you give the Lord a mighty clap offering? Now, let me